So let's go ahead and get started. So this is me. I'm Brian Wetton. I'm the founder of the Riesling Computer Company. We're based out of Utah, and I flew up here for Linux Fest. Um, my talk is called Digital Naturalization for the Elderly with Linux. It's really, really long. And when I was writing an article to submit to opensource.com, I came up with a way better title, which is GNU for Grandma. <laughs> it's so, it's better, but I can't change what I am in the program, so call it what you will. This is about making sure that our elders stay connected to us as technology changes and things like that. So big thank you to Linux Fest Northwest. It doesn't look like any of the staff are in here, but I am honored that when I put in my proposal to speak that they accepted me. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be presenting in front of you guys. I also love the Document Foundation. LibreOffice is fantastic. I like it more than its Windows alternative. I don't use it because I have to, but I use it because I actually like it. So I just wanted to show that appreciation. So I mentioned this a little bit before. I do want you to reserve your questions till the end. I have a lot of content to get through. Um, I also know I'm going to be covering somewhat controversial topics in relation to age discrimination, as well as the process of getting older, what happens to you as you get older, and things like that. Um, and also, we're talking about distros and things like that. So let's just keep the flame war until the end. We'll talk about it then. Let's also try to stay civil at the end. I'm not trying to say yell at me. but um, Also, at the end, just while we're in here, make sure that it's a, a question on topic to the presentation. Um, once, we, once I do open it up for questions and not a comment, um, I, my flight leaves tomorrow night. So if you want to like come hang out with me and just talk about this, I'm here until tomorrow evening. And this last part comes from my time in theater and film before I jumped into the software world as much is, you know, please silence your cell phones and enjoy the rest of the show. So. I am of the firm belief that Linux and the free software community are in a unique position to make sure that our elders stay connected to us. I think we have the right ideologies, the right tools, the right operating system. Just everything is so perfect for these people that I think that not only should we be putting it on cloud servers and our own home servers and things like that, I think we should be getting it into the hands of our elders to welcome, hey guys. But I think we should get it into the hands of our elders, get it into the hands of people older than us, and teach them how to use it so that they can stay connected to us and have all the best parts of being human, which are the other people. So I have a really dumb question. Why, why do you think someone who's older wants to use a computer? Um, let's, let's get some answers from the room. I, stay connected. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. That's what most of my customers are doing, actually, is they're using it to stay in touch with their grandkids. That's one of the main reasons. Check out a website that the TV tells you to check out. Yeah. No, online shopping is actually a big one as well. Um, teaching them how to, you know. Check their bank balance. Online banking is actually a huge one as well. Did you have something to say? I just play poker. Yeah. I don't know if there's, is there a poker in the? Yeah. Awesome. I mean, like, I, I just, I just play Isle Rot Solitaire and Minesweeper, so. But it's but nice to know that there's poker. Is there poker in the repos, like of any of the distros? I think that is uh, like that's the poker TH. Software. Okay, awesome. Did you say something, Devin? No, I was just thinking because tech connected. Yeah, so. for sure. And what, I think your name was Allie. Yeah, that's right. Nice. What's up? Did you have something to add or? Um, I did, and I lost it. Okay, that's totally fine. <laughs> But yeah, like, it's not that hard to come up with reasons. And like, we have really advanced reasons for using computers. We do software development and gaming, rendering, machine learning, all those cool things. But there are also some really great basic uses for a computer. Why don't they? So who, let's gauge the room. I, I'm curious to see what you guys think as to why our elders don't use computers. Complex. Sorry, what? They're complex and they're so hard to use. <laughs> Okay, well, hold on to that. Um, does anyone have any other answers they want to throw out there or personal experience? Go Difficulty ahead. typing. Difficulty typing, absolutely, actually. Uh, maybe vision problems. Vision problems as well, some, some accessibility issues. Confusing interface. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So in research done by the Pew Research Center, Pew Study Center, I can't remember exactly what their name is, they found it's actually just demographics. They were just born a little too early. Because all of these reasons that you mentioned, they're complex machines, they have 
except for the accessibility. That's actually a, that's separate from what I'm talking about here with the demographics because that is actually very real and not something to do with their mental or intellectual ability because they're, you don't really get dumber as you get older. Like everything else just changes. That's what happens when you get older. It's not that you get dumber, it's just everything else changes around you. And as far as the research has been able to find, it's pure demographical reasons as to why most people as they get older don't use computers. It's just that they exited the workplace and academia before computers became ubiquitous. So this is me when I was 10 years old, also around the time I was introduced to Blender and free software and Linux. I, I don't know, it's kind of a cute picture. You can think what you want though. Um, here's why I bring up my childhood. It's because I grew up around old people. I lived in a neighborhood where I lived with a lot of World War II vets, a lot of people who made it through the Great Depression and things like that. Um, in addition to hanging out with people my own age, I also spent a lot of time listening to stories from people who were much older than me about the life that they had lived and how things were so different before even typewriters were ubiquitous. And one person in particular was my grandma. So she lived with us for a couple of years before she passed away. Um, we installed the stair lift, we made her meals, we helped her just function and live in the twilight years of her life. And she had a huge interest in genealogy. And all of the best tools to do genealogy are online now since we've moved away from microfilm readers in the last 20 years. So grandma, she, you know, she's old. She really wanted to learn how to do genealogy and things like that. And we kind of decided like, why not? Like, why shouldn't we help grandma learn how to use genealogy and things like that? And so we got her a laptop. We set her up with a username and a password and things like that. And she was able to do genealogy on her own. She was able to find old public archives of documents and records and things like that and index them into other databases because the GUIs have become so simple and things like that. And she was contributing to these public databases of public records and indexing records and things like that. Right up until the day she died, basically, in her 90s. And that was awesome. She was... She wasn't bedridden, but she was homeridden. She wasn't able to leave the house on her own without someone driving her or pushing her wheelchair, things like that. So this really helped her increase her autonomy later in her life where she had something that she could do that she was really passionate about, she really cared about, and to connect her with her ancestors and things like that. That was something very important to my grandmother. And I have one more story to share about my mom. This is us back in November at a technology conference in Salt Lake City, um, Silicon Slopes Tech Summit. If, I, don't, I don't know if anyone's a local to Utah or went to that. But this is my mom and I at a technology conference. Um, there was a singular experience that gave me the idea for my business that happened about a year ago. Um, my older brother called me close to Christmas and he said, hey, I'm pulling money together from all the siblings. And I'm also wanting to make sure everyone's on the same page where we're going to be mom's tech support. Because up until that point, we had essentially like one shared family computer. Kids used it during the day. Dad used it at night. So mom didn't really get to learn. But she wanted to use Facebook and email. She was starting a business. She couldn't really do those things. And so my brother saw a need there. And he decided to buy her a computer, get everyone on board with it, and so that my mom could use her computer on her own. And since then, she's been able to keep going her, with her business. She sells custom-made American Girl doll clothes and does like American Girl doll camps. It's really adorable. And she's way more politically active. She's at almost all of the Utah Senate hearings and things like that because she's able to stay up to date on those things. And she's happier. I can tell that my mom is happier because she's so enabled in our digital world. I, I, it's something that I can see and something that I can tell. And that's the experience that I'm trying to share. And the experience, those kinds of experiences are what I base my business model around. So let's get some terminology out of the way and talk about why I've named my talk Digital Naturalization for the Elderly. So way back in the early days of the internet, during the declaration of the internet, there were two terms coined. There were digital natives and digital immigrants. So digital natives were the kids like me who grew up with a computer in the home and grew up with the internet in our home. I used Wikipedia in elementary school, dates me a little bit. But they also talk about digital immigrants, where the people who weren't raised with those things in their home and 
became adopted into digital society later in their life. So it's the second group that I'm focusing on there is the internet is so ubiquitous and it's such a basic service that the elderly can really benefit from it and there's not really anyone talking about how we're going to teach them or how we're going to include them in our lives. So this is, this is us. We're the Riesling Computer Company, enabling autonomy through GNU Linux. The um, reason it's called Riesling is because I wanted to name my company after something that gets better with age. Riesling is wine. I have to explain this to people in Utah. Not so much here, which I'm actually kind of grateful for. And also, that's where our logo comes from. It's a champagne glass. I don't know how well you can see it because it's kind of cut off in the bottom corner there. But even in the free software and Linux communities, I'm asked why I've chosen GNU Linux specifically because people have said like, well, why don't you just support Windows because everyone knows how to use Windows? Or why don't you just use Mac? Because it's the simplest thing in the world. And first off, Linux is my home. I, like I said, I've been using it forever and I know how to fix it when it breaks and I know how to keep it from breaking. And I really, really like it. So. And I really, really believe strongly in the idea of free and open source software and steering our lives away from the proprietary. So, let's see. This is also a huge thing. Um, the ideals of proprietary software have not been around for very long, actually. Um, open source existed before proprietary existed. Um, I think Brian Lunduk was talking about in one of his talks the, the old magazines that would send you the basic code because there was no way to ship basic code on a disk cheaply. There wasn't any internet to extract basic code and compile, like that wasn't a thing before. And it also used to be that food wasn't shipped around, but recipes were shipped around, which recipes are source code for how to create something. It used to be that you couldn't ship the product, you could only ship the recipe or the plans for it. So this idea of not being able to get into the source code or modify it or change it or repair it is a very new ideal. And the elderly actually believe pretty strongly in this with their hardware products. So, oh, these are a little out of order. So Free Software Foundation, I think we all know who they are. This is one of their big campaigns is to eliminate DRM with defective by design. My mother, actually, the same one who I taught how to use the computer, I only have one mom, um, she refuses to buy a washing machine that was manufactured after 2000. Because if it's manufactured after 2000, she can't buy replacement parts for it. We have kept the same washing machine going forever. And it hasn't stopped working. It hasn't stopped washing all of their clothes and things like that. And my mom is kind of on the younger side of old things. She's about 60 years old, and most of my customers are in their 70s and 80s right now. So first of all, we have this huge alignment of products that are open. Products used to be built that way. They used to be built in a way that they were easily serviceable by the consumer, and you could buy replacement parts almost anywhere. Also, just a quick note about the Free Software Foundation. This is their Upgrade from Windows campaign. I will never have as awesome a marketing campaign as this. I think it's like... Just all of their marketing materials are just, they're so good. I love the Free Software Foundation. Like, you go, guys. So let's also talk about some other reasons why I've chosen Linux specifically. So money is a big thing. Um, I really wish I had more numbers on this, but very few people in the US have saved for retirement. And this is more a to topic of discussion for a separate forum. We also don't have a whole lot of social security going on. It's not a very robust platform and money kind of dries up as you get older. It's just kind of what happens in America right now is that when you get older you really just don't have as much money. So it's kind of an American thing. Who doesn't know what this is? D does anyone in here not know what this little credit card is? Awesome. So we don't use Raspberry Pis. We use used hardware. We um, have a source supplier who's a computer recycler. We hunt through garage sales and estate sales and things like that. Because you can buy Windows Vista era hardware and just throw new Debian or throw new Ubuntu on it and it runs faster than Windows Vista did. Like that is one of my favorite things about Linux is just that it's so hardware efficient that for the basic things that grandma and grandpa and mom and dad want to do, 
you don't need to spend the 600, 800, whatever dollars that you do at a regular retailer to get up and running with a computer. You can usually get it, I calculated this out, you can usually on average spend about $50 in an hour, and that's all of the upfront costs that you need to have is about $50 at its absolute cheapest to do what most people need to do with their computers. So that's a great advantage for people who don't have any retirement savings and are very, on very limited social security checks. It's something that you can actually sell to them at that point, and you enable them at that point as well. You're not, you know, it's not a very intrusive or, you know, it's not taking advantage of them in the way that you could otherwise. So also, let's talk about data security and privacy. Um, does anyone know what a PEPCAC error is? Do you know, you want to say it for us? Problem exists between the keyboard and chair. chair yeah. yeah, so the problem exists between the keyboard and the chair, and also the ID10. It's the idiot. <laughs> so it's funny when I I used to work at a call center and I did tech support at the call center, and people would call in and like you know these like seventy or eighty old men are like, yeah, I know I'm the pebcac, and like they know guys, but you know, one thing that I talked about is that like I learned in elementary school the basics of staying safe online, like not clicking on the invasive ads, not putting up personal information, and things like that. And also making sure I don't have the same password on every website, rotate my passwords regularly. So grandma and grandpa did not learn that in elementary school. <laughs> and we can't take anything for granted. So not only is there an educational gap there, but Linux does address the security and privacy gap as well where it is a more secure operating system. It has much more security policies and security features. You can, you can contain, like, is it Cubes OS where like every single application runs inside of a container isolated from itself? But you can go as much as you want to with this. So, yeah, like, we have self-aware PEBCAC errors going on here where they know that they can't stay safe online and they avoid it because of that. So through education and through a secure operating system, you can easily overcome this. And last, let's talk about the resistance to change. Who in here uses XFCE or LXDE? Yeah. Um, how about Matei? Nice. Cinnamon? Any Ubuntu Mint people in here? So the Linux community has this beautiful resistance to change with the user interface. Um, and I think you guys can tell where I'm going with this. You can, do, anyway, does anyone know how long XFCE has been around and been aesthetically identical to it is right now? I had to look this up. 15 years? 1996 was when XFCE version one released. Years? 1996 is how long XFCE has been around and functionally very similar to how it is right now. So it's, I think you brought up earlier that complicated interfaces were a problem. So with Linux, you can install a secure, up-to-date operating system with a user interface that never changes. We figured it out, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and also we have things like Cinnamon and Mate that happened with the schism between GNOME 3 and GNOME 2, where communities like, no, I don't like the direction that you're going in. We have that resistance to change in our own philosophies and things like that. And because the primary users of Linux are also the primary developers of Linux, we can create our own things. Like we're not defined by these giant corporations who say, this is what you have to do in order to use our product. We don't have that problem. We can have our secure up-to-date operating systems that look like Windows 95. And that's totally fine. <laughs> and it's what I do. <laughs> this is running Exibenti, by the way. It's so great. So yeah, so let's talk about our make file. Let's talk about how we bring someone up to speed on all of computing in a reasonable amount of time. Because let's face it, sometimes they die. I haven't had any customers die just yet, but you, do, you are on sort of a timeline where not only do they have time limitations of their own, where they have their busy lives, but sometimes they have connections that they want to make or reignite before they pass away or before they forget how to do things or before Alzheimer's kicks in. Like we are in a timetable here where we have to teach them in a timely manner. So let's talk about our make file here. Um, first off, um, let's select a distro. So 
here's the thing, like this on Reddit will like get you lynched immediately if you say anything other than whatever someone else believes in, which is just bad community organizing. But it's a very real question, like what, which distribution are you supposed to select to use with your older family members? And there's kind of three main things that I, or three main criteria that I think you should select. I'm fairly distro agnostic. I don't care too much what you guys use. Um, I use Debian Stable and Ubuntu LTS. It's what works for me. It's where I'm comfortable. It's what I know how to support. Like, I, I can fix it when it breaks. I know how to troubleshoot Ubuntu and Debian Stable. And also, both of them receive regular security updates. I love the LTS model where you can install it for five years and you don't need to worry about it during those five years. Um, and also, because of that resistance to change or things like that, you also need to make sure that the interface is not going to change with an update. Um, like a lot of the rolling release dis or desktop environments like right now. Um, I think is it KDE Neon? That's the rolling release plasma? No, it's based on Ubuntu. Okay. Well, but yeah, but the, but the, the plasma is the rolling release the there KDE where it can change. The KDE yeah, part changes a lot. Part's rolling. The OS is LTS. Yeah, so the OS is the LTS, but the interface is what changes. Welcome, we're just talking about distros right now. So, yeah, these are my three main lessons that I learned. Um, at first, I was, I was just trying Debian Stable, but I wasn't as familiar with that as like the Ubuntu side of things there, so I wasn't able to fix it as much. Um, security updates wasn't really a problem, but it is something to consider. So here are the flavors that I recommend. Anything tangential to this, you're probably gonna be fine is the OpenSUSE Leap type things. The OpenSUSE people I was talking to them, like Leap is fantastic. I've never installed it on anything on my own, but virtual machines, it works great. It's, you know, it's rock solid. It's SUSE because it's amazing. Um, the Fedora CentOS type things, and also the Debian Stable Ubuntu LPS, like I'm using in my business. And things I personally would avoid um, is the OpenSUSE Tumbleweed type things where you can run into some problems, the whole family of Arch and Turgos, Manjaro, Gen 2 type things. I want you to remember that this is for grandma and grandpa. Um, on Reddit, there is this like one legendary user who has his entire family and extended family running on Gen 2. Is it Chrome OS? Or no, he, he has, like he spun up Gen 2 for all of his friends and family members and it's what he does and it, you know, kind of going back to this, it's like, can you fix it when it breaks? That dude knew how to fix Gen 2, and he knew how to maintain it and make sure it had regular security updates. So this is, this is my policy. Just choose what will work for you. I, I don't care what you use. I just, you know, the, I've made mistakes. I don't want you to make those mistakes. So I, I really just want to make sure that you guys can eliminate those frustrations on your own. So um, education's a big part of this, where it's, right now, my company is not so much a technology company as it is an education company, because we're developing a lot of documentation and teaching methods right now. And our elders have a lot of very specific accommodations that they need in order to learn from us. So these are my teaching methods that I've tried. Um, they're written in English and Python and Bash, if that's what you prefer, if that's going to click easier for the developers in here. So our biggest focus is that we're centered around self-sufficiency. We, I want to get to the point with all of my customers where they don't need me there in order to function. Like that's the whole point is that it's an enabler of their autonomy. It's that they can wake up in the morning, they can read their news and read their email and book their flights or do their online insurance or banking or things like that. And I can't, you know, like they can't hire me 24 seven to be there for them. So our, our, all of our teaching methods are based around self-sufficiency. I don't have any customers here yet, but it is the goal that we, I, I want to hand over root access. At some point, we'll see. But I, I want to get to the point of handing over the reins completely, and I teach differently based on that than I would otherwise. So our biggest rule comes from like our biggest rule while we're on site comes from the YouTube channel Extra Credits. I don't know if you guys study game development at all, but Extra Credits is like one of the best online resources for game development. And they have this fantastic episode about how to share video games with people who've never played video games before. 
Because you're like, yeah, I want to show you like Mass Effect and Baldur's Gate and all these things that I grew up with and love, but people who haven't played video games before, it's a very alien world for them. And the biggest rule that they have is to never take away the controller, ever. For us, our rule is never take away the mouse unless you're fixing something. Because repetition is like one of the best teaching tools that I've discovered, and we all have the habits of using a mouse and typing and finding settings and things like that. They're just developing those habits now. So this is the Python code there for how you never take away the mouse. I, it's correct syntax. So like, you've got to try, try again until you succeed. I found, and I, in keeping track of this, that you have to have someone repeat something at least four times before they know how to do it on their own. So if you have them do it about four times, they can you know, make enough mental notes there that, okay, this is how I log in, this is how I send an email, this is where all the buttons are, this is how I can find buttons if they move, because Gmail can change. Um, so I strongly encourage note-taking. It accomplishes a couple of great things. So probably the biggest thing is that I have my understanding of computers, and then they have their understanding of computers, and I'm trying to teach them just how to understand in their own way. And their notes allow them to intellectualize and picture what is going on in a way that makes sense for them that they can reference later. It's, again, part of that self-sufficiency thing is that they know what to do when I'm not there because they were taking notes. And it just gives us breaks throughout because you can run down patients or things like that. But if you take notes, you're good. It's just making a good repository. So I try to spend as little time talking as possible. Um, with this, I really just try to make sure that they, while I'm on site, they're working with them, are doing constantly. You know, we're just running through the drills of opening up and logging into email or opening up the news and searching in Google or DuckDuckGo or things like that. And I, I really try to focus on not talking for the reason that it, you know, I'm just watching what's going on mainly and also I, I'm just listening to them when they have their concerns or when they have their questions. So, and patience is a big one. And it's a very, very specific kind of patience. The first part of it comes from planning. It's just planning that you have enough time that when you're with them, it, you have enough time where they can learn something before you go away. Because otherwise, you run into the situation where you're like at the grocery store or something, and mom's like, hey, come fix my printer. You go over there, you spend 20 minutes, and then come back every week after that. Whereas if you had planned an hour to say, here's how you troubleshoot your printer, that's a much more effective investment of your time where you don't have to spend 20 minutes there every week. Instead, you can just spend an hour there once, and then they know everything after that point. So patience is just a big part of it, and planning, and also while you're on site there, um, Right-clicking is hard. It's, it's hard for people who didn't grow up with it. So, you know, you, you're just patient. You just say, nope, you need to right-click. And here's how you do that again. And then they take notes about it, and then you forget it. Like, it's, it just becomes habit at that point. So, um, this slide is my main joke in my presentation. It's about making analogies that make sense. Apples to penguins, I don't know. And also the Python. Like, do my analogies actually make sense? So, <laughs> so analogies are a big thing because computers are very foreign and alien. I think we kind of lose track of that because we grew up with them or because we've been using them for a long time. Computers are freaking weird. Like, have you looked at how assembly code works and how it's processed? Like, it's so strange. So we have, to, we have to humanize and anthropolo anthropologize things where we have to bridge their understanding with how computers work. Um, a couple ones that I'll throw out here that work really well is the internet is a taxi. You tell it where to go and it takes you there. Um, email is a lot like regular mail. Um, those are kind of the two main ones. And Oh, files and folders. People, so here's the funny thing. Older people actually used to call things that were in folders like files. Like, you, like the papers and documents were called files before. 
They get that they get that one pretty easily, and some good organization teaching right up front will save a lot of headache for everyone. So just make analogies that make sense. Test them out, see if they work. Um, I'm planning on making a GitHub repo of analogies because I'm always looking for good ones, and I know I can't come up with every one. Um, and that's going to go into pretty well into a later part of the talk here, just about how I want to open source all this documentation and teaching. But let's talk about an analogy that illustrates really well a concept that I discovered and not really heard discussed. Does everyone know what this is? Coffee. <laughs> Little to the right. OK. So I have a question in here that will either classify you as a hipster or date you. Who here knows how to ribbon that machine? <laughs> raise them high. Raise them proud, guys. Come on. <laughs> So here's the analogy and here's the concept that I want to get across is the idea of a generational knowledge pool. So like I said, you know, everyone with white hair just raised their hair immediately. I'm sorry, you're the only person with white hair. It's okay. <laughs> oh, there you go in the back. You look a little blonde with the light. But, but this is the idea of a generational knowledge pool is that generations hold on to knowledge specific to them. I mentioned at the beginning um, World War II and the Great Depression. Those are held, like the memories of those things are held in generational knowledge pools. And so is how to use a typewriter. Typewriters are technology, by the way. I will fight anyone who says that they are not technology. Um, and saying that our older people don't use technology, I was like, no, typewriters. Have you seen how complex those things? It's like assembly code in there. So, just because it's not digital. Right. Just because it's not digital does not mean it's not technology. I absolutely agree. So here's why I bring this up. When I was in high school, my siblings and I got obsessed with typewriters. Like, we found them at yard sales and thrift stores, and we were like, these are so cool. Like, we want to write our books and papers on these for school. And we had no idea how to use them. So we had to say, hey, mom and dad, how do you use this piece of technology? Grandma. Right. Uh, grandma wasn't living with us at that point. She'd already passed. But we had to say, like, how do you use this thing? We had to cross that generational knowledge gap to pull from their generational knowledge on how to use and learn how to do this thing. And I do know how to ribbon a typewriter, by the way. I don't know if that makes me a hipster or old, but we'll go. We'll go with it. So yeah, here, here's kind of the meat of the talk and really the big level for the, my organization from here is how do we fight geriatric isolation and depression? It's a big deal. Also, this is I, I use Pixabay for everything. And when you search for a loan on there, this is the public domain image that comes up. So we're going with it. But it's a, this is a big question with a lot of small and big solutions and things like that. But it's just, how do we fight geriatric isolation? And my belief is that we're going to fight it with Linux. I think that's a really great way to do it. So here's kind of where I want to take my company from just on-site support and things like that, is I want to make sure that there is a conversation around how to make sure that our elders are included. This top website, GameAccessibilityGuidelines.com, is a really great resource for anyone going into game development. It talks about how to make sure that your game is accessible for all kinds of different disabilities, be it vision or hearing, muscular, nervous, or things like that. It talks about having reassignable buttons, audio cues that are subtitled, subtitles for dialogue, and things like that that are developed early on. I want to have something like that for technology in general focusing specifically on the elderly. And that's kind of what the GitHub repo is also going to be, is just I want people to contribute their own experiences with their elders and how they overcome them and things like that so that everyone in the community can benefit from it. Um, eventually, I want to figure out how to get mouse drivers to help with nervous tremors. Um, that's one reason that the older people actually struggle with touch screens is because with nervous tremors, it's actually hard to put enough pressure on or just enough pressure to have it register as a touch. And mice are way better at it already because we have physical buttons. But if your hand is shaking like this all the time, there is, like, there's a small amount of tremor there that can make it difficult to press. But if you have the right mouse driver, it doesn't become a problem. Um, I think there was like a super old Windows package that helped out with this and kind of where I got the idea from. 
So, and also, I kind of want to have like GNOME or Plasma or whatever else themes that make the buttons bigger and make the text bigger and stuff like that. Um, one of my first experiences that I had when I was kind of testing out this business model is um, I just turned up the system font size or font scaling. And this woman who had been like this far from the computer screen her whole life actually was sitting back with much better posture. And like at the end of it, you know, we had been working for like an hour or two at that point, but she remarked at the end that she's like, you know, I'm amazed that I don't feel exhausted after using my computer. But it's just because she had the right posture because she couldn't make the text any bigger before. Like it's, it's the simplest things that are difficult to do in other operating systems for whatever reason, but just make sense to do easily in Linux. And that's another great thing is the customization. We have our awesome, awesome desktop environments. So again, I, I was talking with a guy last night at the hotel about how I couldn't figure out if I wanted to start my company for selfish or empathetic reasons. I, I couldn't tell if it's because I wanted to be selfish and be able to stay connected with my kids and grandkids whenever they happen or as I get older that I can stay connected with the generations younger than me, or if it was because of empathy because I've just grown up seeing these struggles over and over again. And I think it's a little bit of both, but here's kind of my big picture goal for the company is I wanna make sure that we keep our generations connected. I wanna make sure that um, it says you bet, I, it, you bet yourself I wanna be there for the cool technology of you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. I want to be there and I want to be included. And I wanna make sure everyone else is included as well in that technology and that connection. So yeah, that's, that's really kind of the big picture there is I want to have the conversation about how we keep our generational lines blurred in terms of knowledge and accessibility and connection. So any Reddit users in here? Raise them high, raise them proud. This subreddit I'm really conflicted about because it's hilarious as hell, but I also feel really bad for laughing at what happens here. This is a collection of screenshots from Facebook about, you know, it's old people Facebook. It's the people who say, Karen, I'm going to dinner on your dog post. Like it's just, it's pictures like that that are kind of funny, but at the same time, there's an underlying sadness there because these are people who've been trying to reach out to us through our technology to connect with us and haven't been able to or haven't been told how to. So I'm kind of declaring like a personal vendetta against them where I want the subreddit to change into positive experiences with our elders on Facebook or something like that instead of just where we make fun of them for trying to stay connected to us because which of those is more noble. So in summation, this is a modification of a quote from our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. And it's that I believe that with great knowledge comes the great responsibility to share it. I want to give everyone in the world, through the free software community and through my company, the experience that I had with my mother, where she was able to become autonomous and start her own business, stay connected with her kids and grandkids across all the different states where we live, and also you know, keep giving the experiences that I've had with my customers so far. One of my main and first customers, um, the main thing that they use their computer for is to stay up to date on all the obituaries. They have an email list that they are subscribed to from all the different newspapers in the area that sends her a list of all the obituaries every morning so that she can attend the funerals of all of her friends. Um, yeah, it's, aging is really weird. <laughs> and it's, it'll be an interesting day when that's what I use my computer for or whatever computers we have in the future, whatever GNU, Linux, free BSD we use in the future. But, I do believe, though, that with great responsibility comes, a, you know, we have a huge responsibility to share our world and our connections with each other with other generations because I don't think anyone should ever die alone. So that's my presentation. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Yeah.